In the previous video, we looked at four popular numerical methods that are used for approximating ordinary and partial differential equations in science and engineering. And here we're going to focus on the finite difference method. So what we're going to do in this video is introduce a specific one-dimensional example. It's relatively straightforward, but because it's a physical example, we can discuss some of the physical and numerical consequences of some of the decisions that we're making. And we're going to walk through that numerical solution procedure. In this video, the first two steps. The first step is applying the physical laws and approximations idealizations, and then the second step is to apply the numerical method for discretization, in this case the finite difference method. So the problem we're going to look at is the extended fin example. This is a heat transfer problem where we have a surface from which we are extracting heat. So let me just sketch this out. So we have a a surface like so. This could be the surface of a computer chip, say, and it has a high base temperature, T sub B, that we want to draw the heat away from the base and then have it be removed through convection from this typically highly conductive material. So we'll start the base is at x is equal to zero, and then the tip will be x is equal to L. And so our x-axis is one-dimensional then along that axis of the extended fin. We have, say, air, or it could be a liquid, with a particular temperature, we'll call it T infinity, that's being blown across the extended fin to draw the heat out. So there is conduction from the base into the fin and along the length of the fin, and then there's convection out of the fin all the way along its length. Okay, so let's think about step one. Step one is applying the appropriate physical laws and whatever idealizations or simplifications that make sense for this particular problem. So the appropriate physical law is conservation of energy because it's a heat transfer problem. And the assumptions we're gonna apply are as follows. The first is we're going to assume that the heat transfer in the fin is only a function of x. In other words, in other words it's a one-dimensional problem. So at every cross-section of the fin, we'll assume that the temperature is equal. Now, think about it. Every time we make such an assumption, we need to think about how good or bad that assumption might be. If we have long, slender fins, maybe that's an okay assumption. If we have larger, so larger cross-sectional area fins, maybe that's not such a great approximation. Or, if we have fins that change cross-sectional area or shape rapidly across the length of the fin, that also might not be a good approximation. So this could be a good approximation in some cases, not so good in others. It also depends on the material out of which the fin is made. If it's highly conductive, then that's a better assumption than if it's poorly conductive. The second assumption we're going to make is that the convective heat transfer, which is given by H, is a constant. So this is encapsulating how the heat is being transferred from the surface of the fin to the air or the liquid that's being blown across it. Where does that come from? That could come from another simulation. It could come from experimental results. We're going to make that assumption. Again, maybe it's a good assumption. Maybe it's not such a good assumption. But it's almost always assumed in heat transfer applications that H is a constant. But, but again, we need to be cognizant of how good or bad that assumption might be. Now you can take conservation of energy plus those two assumptions, you get a 1D ordinary differential equation. That's step one, going from reality to the governing differential equation that governs the physics of that particular system. You'll find this in any book on heat transfer. So here is the equation, d squared t dx squared, so it's a second order ordinary differential equation. t is only a function of x. It has these variable coefficients that you'll see on the first derivative and the zeroth derivative term. So it is a second order linear, even though it's a little complicated looking, it's still a linear equation, second order, but variable coefficients because of these in parentheses. The capital T here is the temperature distribution along the length of the fin. A sub C is the cross-sectional area. That could be a function of X if the shape is changing along the length. A sub S is also a function of X. That's the surface area from the base. 
it's always a function of x because it starts at zero and it's the accumulated surface area as you move along the length of the fin. H here is the convective heat transfer coefficient again, and K, which you see here with the H, that's the thermal conductivity. That's a property of the material out of which the fin is made. So that's step one, and we get what's called a boundary value problem. So we have the governing equation inside the domain, and then we're gonna need boundary values, in this case for temperature, at the boundaries of the domain. Now let's simplify the form of the equation just a little bit. So let's take T minus T infinity. Remember that's the ambient temperature of the liquid or the air or whatever is being used to cool the fin. And let's subtract that from the temperature T. So U of X will be our new dependent variable, which is just the difference between the actual temperature and that constant ambient temperature. And then the coefficients on the first and zeroth derivative term I'm going to combine into these f of x and g of x coefficients. So again, it's just a second order linear variable coefficient, ordinary differential equation, just as before. I haven't changed anything about the equation, just the form of it. And then you can see the cross-sectional area is encapsulated in f of x, and then the surface area, a sub s, along with these two properties, as well as the cross-sectional area, comprise the g of x. Now in differential equations, we need the equation itself and the boundary conditions. At the base of the fin, we have the temperature T sub B. Subtract off the ambient temperature T infinity, that'll be U sub B, and that is the what we call Dirichlet or fixed boundary condition at the base of the fin. So we know the temperature, it's a constant temperature boundary condition at X is equal to zero. Now at the tip, in reality, we probably would not know the temperature at the tip and we will later on look at a more physically relevant boundary condition, but for now let's just assume we know the temperature at the fin, and that'll be T sub L, again subtract off the T infinity, to give us the U sub L at X equals L. So together, the governing equation, as well as the boundary conditions, comprise the mathematical model. That is the result of step one. So we now have the mathematical model that we could solve for this particular heat conduction problem. Now we have a choice. If we can solve it analytically, we would typically do so. If we can't, then we would continue with the numerical solution procedure to use a numerical method to solve it and get approximate solutions for the temperature along the length of the fin. Of course, that's what we're gonna do here. Now the second step then is to perform the discretization. So we choose the numerical method we're gonna use. We're gonna use finite difference methods here. So we're gonna take the length of the fin, x going from zero to L, and we're gonna divide it up into capital I equal subintervals along its length. So delta x, the length of each little segment, will be L over I. So the way this will look is as follows. So we have the length, x going from zero to L at the tip, from the base to the tip, and then we're gonna number each grid point, we'll call it, like so. So each of these is a delta x apart. We have equal subintervals, as we said. And this point will be a generic point, x sub i. So x sub i could be any point along the length of the fin. So generically, we have the point itself, x sub i, and then the point delta x to the right, which is x sub i plus 1, x sub i minus 1. Now you'll notice I've started the index at 1 here which means I end with capital I plus one. So we have capital I intervals, which means we have capital I plus one points, or grid points, mesh points, whatever you want to call them. Now you'll notice I started the index here with one. In mathematics, that's typically what we do, right? So the first element in a vector or a matrix is the one, or the one, one element. So mathematical programming languages, such as MATLAB, Mathematica, Fortran, those that are written for us, they by default will start their arrays, which we use to encapsulate vectors and matrices, with one. So one, two, three, up to capital I plus one. For programming languages that are used more generally, that were not written for us, such as C and Python, they typically start with zero. They, they think it's silly that we want to start with one. We want to start with one because that's how we do the mathematics. We start our numbering with one in our vectors and matrices. So if you're using Python, for example, you either will start with zero, 
and end with capital I, and then of course just shift everything by one, or you can specify your arrays to start with one and go to capital I plus one. Either way is, is perfectly fine. Now these two coefficients, the F and the G, are now going to be taken at each grid point. They're continuous functions, but we're going to take them at each grid point. And we're going to use a shorthand here. So F sub I is shorthand for F at X sub I. So that's the value of F at the X sub I point right here. Same thing for G, same thing for U. So the solution U sub I is the value of U approximated at X sub I. So that's the typical notation that we'll use. Okay, so we've discretized the domain into these pieces, and now we want to look at how we discretize the equation itself. I'll go through the formal derivation of these finite difference approximations using Taylor series in the next video, but for now I just want to introduce this intuitively. So if you think about the definition of the derivative, so go back way back to the first class of your Calc 1 course. So du dx approximated at a particular point x sub i. So that's the limit as delta x goes to zero, u at x sub i plus delta x minus u at x i over delta x. So that's rise over run, how much change in u there is from one point to the next, divided by the distance between those points, rise over run. And in the limit, as delta x goes to zero, as two points get closer and closer together, you get the exact value of the first derivative, in other words, the slope, rise over run, of your function. So let's just use that and intuitively then think about how we could get a finite difference. So here's the difference, right? Something minus something. And the finite aspect of the finite difference is we're going to take this delta x small but finite. So no, don't take the limit all the way to zero. Let's get rid of that. And we're just going to take a point to the right. So that would be this one right here, xi plus delta x minus the point itself. That would be this one divided by the distance between them. And that will be an approximation. We'll call it a forward difference approximation for the first derivative. So that's a finite difference. Now the way this would look graphically is something like this. So here's u versus x. And let's say my u versus x function looks something like this. And here's the point x sub i at which I want to get the slope. So the actual slope is tangent to that. So this would be the exact slope. Now if I take a point to the right, so that's x i plus 1, which is a delta x to the right, then the definition of the derivative says take this slope, I'll use a dashed line, between those two points, and that would be the forward difference. So it's the value of u at this point minus the value of u at this point divided by the delta x distance between them. But you can see it's not the same as the actual slope at x sub i. So it's only an approximation, but as delta x gets smaller, it's a better and better approximation. Now based on that, we can imagine two other possibilities. The simple one to imagine is, well, we could take a delta x to the left. That would be an x i minus 1, so this point. And then again, take the difference between those, rise over run. And this would give us what's called a backward difference. For obvious reasons, we're using the point and a backwards point. Here we're using a point and a forwards point. So again, rise over run, that will give us another approximation, which, which you can see is also going to have some error to it. But that would be a, a comparable backward difference. Now you could also imagine, what, imagine one other possibility. And that's if you go between these two points. That's called a central difference. So it's the value here at xi plus 1 minus the value here at xi minus 1 divided by the distance between them which is 2 delta x. So you notice the forward difference is ui plus 1 minus ui over delta x. This one minus this one divided by the distance. Backward difference is ui minus ui minus 1. This one 
minus this one, divided by the distance between them. Now these are all for the first derivative. They're all approximations of the slope of the function at x sub i. The central difference takes this point minus this point, divided by the distance between them. So that's ui plus 1 minus ui minus 1 over 2 delta x. So we have three different approximations for the same thing. And I'm just motivating these intuitively. We'll drive all three of these formally using Taylor series. And the question, of course, we have at this point is, well, which one's better? If I have three options for doing the same thing, which one should I choose? Now, just based on the situation I've drawn here, it would look like this central difference is going to be closer to this exact slope. And that is indeed the case. But is that just because the way I've drawn my u of x? Would it be different for different u of x's? and how much better is it in a formal sense. So through the derivation using Taylor series, we'll be able to determine how good or bad these approximations are relative to each other, and that will be the basis for making decisions about which ones we should use.